Today, we confer an honorary degree on Dan Shaughnessy, an award-winning journalist and author. Many of you have probably read Mr. Shaughnessy's coverage of the Boston Red Sox over the years on the pages of the Boston Globe. Dan documented the Red Sox run to the World Series, and this is really painful to read, and subsequent loss to the Mets, producing the book One Strike Away, and later The Curse of the Bambino. In fact, Dan is a prolific writer and the author of 12 books. He has been named the Massachusetts Sports Writer of the Year 12 times and named one of the top 10 sports columnists in America by the Associated Press Sports Editors 11 times. Most recently, Dan received the J.G. Taylor Spink Award for meritorious contributions to baseball writing presented annually at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Mr. Dan Shaughnessy, it is my honor and great pleasure to award you with the degree of Doctor of Public Affairs. Thanks, everybody. This is, uh, this is the happiest graduation I've ever been to. It's, it's like, it feels like the playoffs, you know? Everybody's, uh, everybody's fired up here. Love it. Um, so we start off, you know, ladies, gentlemen, faculty, friends, trustees, parents, and of course, students. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to have a chance to speak to so many worthy, hardworking students who are getting their degree today. <clears throat> this is my second commencement speech. Six years ago, I got a call in April from a trustee at Nichols College, <clears throat> a fine business school in Dudley, Massachusetts. I was honored and flattered, and of course said yes. But the invite seemed a little late in the game. I had to ask, who bailed on you? <laughs> the trustee was a little embarrassed. He stammered, actually, it was the owner of the Patriots, Bob Kraft. <laughs> So, wise guy that I am, I took this antidote to launch my graduation speech that day. I wanted the grads to remember and be reminded it's okay not to be first choice. My first professional break was in 1977. I was 23, intimidated by student loans, living in a cheap apartment, covering high school sports, bartending. I applied to a bunch of newspapers all around the country, got the usual non-responses or form letter rejections. One of the no responses was really well deserved. It turns out in my application to the Milwaukee Journal to cover the Milwaukee Brewers, I misspelled Milwaukee every time on the application. I wonder why I didn't hear from those guys. So there's a lesson there. Do your homework, even in graduation speeches. More than 10 years ago, a former network anchor agreed to deliver the commencement address at Wheaton College in eastern Massachusetts. Early in her remarks, she launched into a tribute about what an honor it was to be speaking at a school, and she started citing the world-famous graduates of Wheaton College, and she mentioned Dr. Billy Graham. Well, this was a giveaway, because Wheaton had been an all-girls school until the 70s, I think, <laughs> and there's all this murmuring in the auditorium that, that the speaker doesn't really know where she is, because there's a Wheaton College in Illinois where Billy Graham went. Um, it was like one of those want to get away commercials, you know, where you're like, hey, thank you, Detroit. Uh, well, we're in Chicago. That's okay. <laughs> so I know where I am today, and thank you, Southern New Hampshire, for allowing me to share a few thoughts. I know that many of you here are the traditional grads, 21, 22 years old, the traditional path, and you're graduating today. I also know this class is peppered with adults who've been out there in the workforce or serving in the military. Some of you raised families while working toward this degree. Nothing's been given to you. Count me, with, count me as one who has fallen in love with the TV school, the TV spot, in which Dr. LeBlanc behind me says, the world in which we live equally distributes talent, but it doesn't equally distribute opportunity. I love that. I think it knocks me out of my chair every time. It should be stenciled on the walls of every social and educational institution. So thank you, Dr. LeBlanc, making my job easier. It's good. So, I don't know, a year or so ago, I delivered a speech to a bunch of insurance underwriters downtown Boston. It was a big hotel. And uh, they wanted a conference call, the guys who were arranging this, to, 
talk about what, I, what was going to be my topic. Usually it's Boston sports. Hey, it's the high renaissance of Boston sports. Everybody knows that. All of our teams are great. This is an amazing time. But uh, they wanted, this, this guy was kind of a, he was kind of a boring guy, and he said, well, I really would like you to talk for an hour about the inner workings of the Patriots organization. I said, no one knows about the inner workings of the Patriots organization. <laughs> the people who work inside Gillette Stadium would have made the best POWs in the history of warfare. They give up nothing. So we're never going to know why Malcolm Butler didn't play in that Super Bowl. <laughs> Here's what I do know. The world of sports that I've covered is lined with stars who did not take the traditional path. Ted Williams, Mexican-American, grew up with an absentee mother, absentee dad, and his mother worked as a soldier in the Salvation Army. Ted and his brother were the original latchkey kids in San Diego in the 1930s. Ted made his way to the majors on hard work and dedication of the craft of hitting a baseball. And then, when he's at the top of his game, he twice left the major leagues to serve his country in World War II and the Korean War. He flew 38 missions in Korea while he was American League MVP, and one time his plane was on fire, and he knew not to try to land, not to use the ejection device, because he was told it would break your legs. So he took a shot, landed his plane on fire, and was able to come back to the big leagues. Larry Bird covered him for five years. He grew up with very little. He went to University of Indiana in Bloomington, big shot university, and he was like intimidated by all of his classmates and his roommate had great clothes and all, automobiles and stuff that he, he didn't understand how, how a kid could have all these privileges. So he, he quit, he hitchhiked home, and he went to work on a, on a truck as a trash collector. A year later, he resumed his studies at a smaller state school Things worked out pretty well for Larry Bird. And then there's Malcolm Butler, the hero of the Patriots win in Super Bowl 49. This guy, he played his first college ball at Heinz Community College in Mississippi, then two seasons at West Alabama in Division II. He's not drafted on draft day. He goes to work at a Popeye's Chicken where he's a batter cook and dishwasher. And he had an agent who got him an offer to try out with the New England Patriots. He gets to New England, he's trying out, he's so, he's so low on the depth chart, they don't even give him a number. But Tom Brady, after a few days, says, who's this guy without a number who's intercepting all my passes? And they say, well, that's Malcolm Butler. Maybe we'll take a second look at him. He wins the Super Bowl, and today he's got a multi-million dollar contract. Not with the Patriots, unfortunately. But, so whether you are 21 and following the traditional path, or 45 and already supporting a family, there's one universal truth in following your dreams and overcoming setbacks. This I have learned. It's a waste of time to get jealous or compare your success to others. No matter how much you do or how far you go, there will always be someone not as good as you who is doing better. Just as there will always be someone perhaps more talented than you who is not doing quite as well. Don't waste energy worrying about it. Setbacks, we've all had a few. When I was 20, I was writing for the Holy Cross alumni publication. The editor hated me. He was sort of an elitist guy. And he said to me, a college senior, he said, I can't understand why someone who can't write would want to go into journalism. That's like someone who stutters wants to be a television broadcaster. So I thanked him for the inspiration, and I moved on. <laughs> then there was the New Yorker magazine. You all know the New Yorker. Big deal, literary publication. J.D. Salinger, Truman Capote, they all made their bones there. Well, I was an English major at Holy Cross, and one of my graduation gifts was a paid subscription to the magazine. I devoured it every week, reading all that great fiction, John Cheever, John Updike. I was inspired to write my own stories, as young people are. It's a good thing. And I mailed them to the New Yorker, confident I would be discovered and made rich and famous due to my dazzling prose. Well, that did not happen. It was actually worse than that. Not only did the New Yorker not discover me or make me rich and famous, they didn't even send a rejection slip. The worst of all, the magazine stopped coming to my apartment. <laughs> it was almost like they said, this guy's not even worthy of reading us. You know, that is rejection. That's it for me. This is your happy day, your celebration. Get out there and write your own stories.